All right. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here for the second Toolkit Fiction live broadcast. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which the Wheeler Centre stands, where I'm broadcasting to you from this evening. Um, I'd like to pay my respect to Elders past and present and to thank them for their continued hospitality on this unceded land, particularly as tonight we are talking about this session, um, both in terms of place and in terms of time. The Wurundjeri people have cared for this land for many, many, many thousands of years, and we continue to benefit from their teaching and wisdom. My name is Jennifer Down, and it's my great pleasure to facilitate the fiction program this year. I'm also thrilled to be joined tonight by Claire Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Claire is a Noongaratta from Western Australia. Her family are associated with the area around Ravensthorpe and Hopeton. Am I pronouncing Hopeton correctly? Who's Hopetown? In WA. In WA? There's different pronunciations, different schools. I knew I, I knew if I didn't ask that, I would mess it up. <laughs> uh, Hopetown. <laughs> Claire grew up in a forestry settlement in the middle of a tree plantation where her dad worked um, not far out of Perth. She wrote the manuscript for Terra Nullius, um, which won the State Library of Queensland Black and Right Fellowship while travelling around Australia during the caravan, which is something we will return to in a second. Um, amongst many other accolades, um, Terra Nullius was shortlisted for the 2018 Stella Prize very recently um, and the ABA Matt Michelle Award for New Writers, and it was also highly commended in this year's uh, Victorian Premier's Literary Award. Um, it's truly one of the most powerful works. In my notes, I wrote one of the most powerful works of speculative fiction, which sounds like a, a tough quote. <laughs> like, who am I? Um, but not just speculative fiction, it's one of the most powerful works of fiction that I've read for a very long time. Um, I had the pleasure of revisiting it in the context of speaking with Claire this evening. Um, and I'm so excited to have her join us. So thank you for no, thank you. your presence. Um, before we get started, sorry, I just have to do this really briefly, I'll, I'll race through it. Um, a little bit around the program, Toolkits is an intensive 12-week course for writers under 30. Um, it's run by Express Media, who you will be familiar with, no doubt, as the publishers of VoiceWorks magazine, magazine um, and also the facilitators of pro programs such as um, Tracks. Um, it's a digitally based program, which means that anybody can access it. You just need an internet connection. Um, and this year we've been fortunate enough to work with uh, young writers all over Australia. Um, this is actually the final Toolkits Fiction broadcast for 2018, but applications will open very shortly for the poetry program, and that's facilitated by the wonderful Melody Paloma, who also ran it last year, um, author of In Some Ways Dingo. Um, what else? Applications are also open now for the 2018 John Marsden and the Shet Australia Prize, which Express also administers, um, as well as the 2018 Scribe, sorry, Scribe Nonfiction Prize for Young Writers. I knew I was going to cock up that title. Um, so entries for the John Marsden and the Shet Prize close on the 29th of June, and entries for the Scribe Nonfiction Prize close on the 9th of September. So you've got more time for the nonfiction. Um, this evening, Claire and I are going to speak. <laughs> I just, I feel like I've got to race through all the admin stuff before we get to the interesting stuff. And there's all of this. It's like when you listen to a podcast and you've got the ads up top yes. and you've got to just like skip through it. So skippers come back in. Um, Claire and I are going to talk tonight about setting. I'm really keen to um, have a chat about both, um, not just setting as a physical place, but also things like um, climate and um, time and temporality. Um, for you guys watching, um, please feel free to ask questions via Twitter. You can use the hashtag EMToolkits, that's the letters EM. Um, or you can ask questions on the Express Media Facebook page. Um, and I will do my best, Tony Jones, as they come in. <laughs> I don't have as much practice as him. Um, so Claire, you were just mentioning before, while we were setting up, you were talking about writing Terra on an iPad. Yes, I did. Yes, while you moved around Australia in yep. a caravan. Um, and I think there's also, there's a sense of that in the novel, there's a sense of movement um, and it's, the narrative is sort of fragmented in some ways. Yes, yes. Do you think, um, do, you, is, do you think that you could have written this book or that it would have been the same book if you'd been sort of stationary? I'm, I'm interested in what, um, what effect that, that movement had on the writing process. Well, I probably would have written a book if I was stationary. 
but it would have been the same book. It wasn't until someone asked me a question just like that mm. that I realised that nearly every character in Terminalius is on the move. Mm. Like I was. I was yeah. travelling, I was moving every day, and, and every character was moving every day. Um, and yeah, it wasn't until I was asked that question that I realised that was the case. So certainly the travel and movement was a major part of the story and therefore it was a major part of my experience at the time. They certainly had to work, definitely. Was that something that was, um, I, I guess I related to that when I was reading Terminalius and reading about your experience yeah. writing it because um, while I've always lived in Melbourne, um, I, have this, I have this sort of deep fascination for movement and, and the sort of change of place. And a lot of my writing, when I'm writing short stories and things like that, I noticed that people in my stories are often moving. It might be in a boring way, like a car trip, but yep. the story might take place over the course of that. Do you think that, um, I don't know, like to what extent do you reckon that your sort of personal preference for, for interrogating new places plays into... I don't. I you're writing. I'm, I'm not even certain. I can say that I have a a preference for interrogating new places. Even I think mm. I was travelling because there were things I wanted to see, and because I was really jacked off with being in the city. To be honest, in Melbourne City. In Melbourne. Yeah, can you write? Because uh, I was in Melbourne, and it's not Melbourne personally. It's Melbourne. Um, Melbourne probably my favourite city. It's just the concept of cities in yeah. in general. So I thought, well, if I'm going to be jacked off for the city, I might as well. Go traveling if I'm going to travel, I'll well do a big one, and it was a big one, it was two years. Can you talk a little bit about the geography of that trip if you don't mind? Well, the for that trip, I started in Melbourne, um, went across the south coast and then up the west coast mm -hmm. from Perth, across the top, then down to Alice Springs, mm -hmm. and then I went back to um, back to Melbourne, up the east coast, and then across the top and down to Alice Springs again. But I started Terminalius in Perth, right up the west coast, and then down to Alice Springs, finished Alice Springs, edited it on the way back to Melbourne, sent off to a black and white, white prize in Queensland from Melbourne, found out I was, that I won the prize on the way back to the east coast, edited Terminalius across the top of Queensland, and then the, the um, kind of first structure edit, and then finished the edit when I got back to Melbourne again. So, <laughs> truly, there's the imprint of oh, it does. <laughs> But mostly, most of the um, the main first draft narrative was written up the east coast, up the, up the west coast in WA, yeah. through the main kind of outback coast area. It was interesting. I was reading something I think on the weekend, um, and it was I think it was a review, but it, it talked about how this felt like an intrinsically WA book. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what your thoughts on that are. I've not been lucky enough to spend very much time in WA, I've only ever visited Perth City. Um, and I'm kind of interested by what that might mean to, for you as somebody whose ancestors are from that area. Well, the, yeah, the, the landscapes are very Western Australian. They're not all the same part of Western Australia because um, I had no particular intent to keep the setting in a particular part of Western Australia. I just used whatever place felt right at the time. The drove made it as mad. Because he's saying, he um, how, did, how did it get from that place to that place? <laughs> that's, that's they obviously looked into the geography and realised that my geography was jumping all over the place. Yeah. He was doing whatever felt right for the sea. But nearly all of it is Western Australian and Northern Territory in field. Mm -hmm. So um, we're talking the west, um, the west coast, north of Perth, the south coast, not so much Perth, there is mention of Perth at all, but the west coast and then the south of Perth area and the inland Spinifex Plains, mm -hmm. as I mentioned as well. So, yeah, it's very west Australian, quite a bit northern territory, and a little bit of south Australian, very little of the east coast. Yeah. Were, if any. were those, uh, sorry, were there any places that you kind of visited when you were travelling around and writing this that you hadn't previously visited? Or spent time in that you kind of you really latched onto and thought, yes, this is the place where such and such happens. Well, I was born in Perth, so, mm. and I'd been along the south coast of WA before, but I'd never been north, um, north of Perth further than Geraldton. Okay. So the Pilbara and the Kimberley were new to me, and they they're also um, important landscapes in the yeah. So it was definitely a bit of the Pilbara and the Kimberley in there, and I've never, yeah, I've definitely never seen it before. Yeah. 
it was interesting. I, I was thinking, I don't know if this is a weird thing to say, but the, the, the novel made me want to. <laughs> For those of you who haven't read it, it's a, a speculative work that some, I don't know, wouldn't have described as an apocalyptic. Um, and I, I was thinking about <laughs> how there's so many descriptions and evocations of place in here that made me want to see parts of the country that I haven't seen before. But that's kind of at odds with the, the story or the narrative, which is, is fairly devastating. It is an uh, yeah, it's a pleasantly unpleasant story. Mm. It's fun to read, but it's a bit not nice. Why, yeah, <laughs> sorry, can I just, <laughs> while I've got you here, this has nothing to do with setting, but can I, um, what was, um, was that sort of your intention with writing it? My intention was to be shocking. Yeah. Um, to whom? To, to white people. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Uh, to ignorant white people, yeah. particularly, but mm, all white people, but particularly the ignorant ones. Yes. And I don't know, there's a part of, maybe a cynical part of me, that there's a part of me that thinks that's probably not that hard. And yet, this is a very. Um, it's not hard to shock, to shock white people. <laughs> uh, but, but this is, it's a very, um, it's a very nuanced and very uh, complex book, I Thank think. You. Well, no, I, I, I just, I wonder at how you, again, nothing to do with setting, but I wonder at how you sort of balance that. You know, it would be very easy to write something sort of parodied um, yes. colonisation and, and it's, you know, even its most devastating effects, but this never verges into that. It's much more, um, oh, it's, it's much more complex and, and involved than that. Well, I suppose... I did what everyone says you should do. I wrote what I wanted to read. Mm. I wrote the book that didn't exist. Yeah. So then I kept going, gee, I wish that I wish this sort of book existed and it didn't, so I made it happen. Yes. Yes. I well it's in speaking of that, I I I think I mentioned this to you already, but um I was thinking about how I can think of several examples of sort of contemporary um, contemporary literature that has been produced in like the last couple of years alone mm -hmm. by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers, kind of working in the space of um, not necessarily speculative fiction, but deals sort of with these quasi-apocalyptic narratives. Um, and I was thinking about like the middle section of Alan Manniven's Heat and Light, yes. um, which sort of deals with, I forget the name, like the water, mm -hmm. the water people. Um, and this is something that we actually discussed last year with, um, we had Tony Birch coming to talk about at the time he was, well, he still is, but was working a lot of these sort of essays around um, climate change and things like yeah. that. Um, I'm just, I'm kind of, could you speak a little bit more about what, what it is in that, narrative of apocalypse that particularly resonates um with you and i am not asking you to speak for you know sort of all first nations people here but it is sort of a theme that you see you know alexis wright um mm -hmm. i think is somebody who's dealt with this yes. and even bruce pascoe like dark Amy was obviously um non-fiction but i think it kind of challenges some of those the, the stereotypes or the preconceptions that we may have had previously well um, yeah the the way I, I see the world is if you imagine the colonisation or the invasion in 1788, not as, which, as it's always shown, which is, there's two ways it's shown, which is white people coming to somewhere where there's nobody mm -hmm. and just moving in, or white people coming to where there's primitives in our culture and imposing a new culture. They're the two different narratives. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at the third narrative, which is a civilization declaring war on another civilization, which is a more accurate narrative for what happened. There was culture here, there was agriculture, there was there were nations, there were um, there was educational systems, religions, everything you know, architecture, everything you need for civilization was in place here. But so the apocalypse in Australia was when um, people who had what well, one civilization with complete disdain invaded another civilization and tried to destroy it. And that's exactly what happened in Australia. And so in that sense this sort of um, the apocalypse is really something that's already happened. It has happened. And um, yeah, it's a bit of a recurring theme in my talking and essay writing lately, the idea that the apocalypse is not upon us, it's yes. in our past. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I wrote down to more or less, you know, yeah. a paraphrased version of that very quote from an article that was, yes. in, that was on the ABC online last year where he said, 
We don't have to imagine an apocalypse, we survive one. We don't have to imagine a dystopia, we live in one day after day after day. And that's, that's exactly right, because the apocalypse is the idea of complete destruction of civilization and mm. and death of most of the people involved in it. And that's exactly what happened. Mm. Uh, so, and the yeah, dystopia. It's, I've heard before a very telling thing that a lot of people say that dystopias are defined by somebody always think it's a utopia. Yes. And in Australia, that's exactly what we've got. Yes. People call this the lucky country. And yet, if you think about the concept of dystopia, somebody thinks it's the lucky country, to other people, it is definitely not mm. the case. And even the idea of the lucky country, when that, when that phrase first came out, or first was brought into the lexicon, it was intended as a critique. Yes. And it's been bastardised by, you know, decades of people going, look how good we've got it, you know, through sort of, we had the golden age of, you know, quasi-socialism in the 70s, and then we had, like, all the shit that came after it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still calling ourselves the lucky country because, I don't know, we refuse to reflect on, on the, not just our colonial past, but, you know, those kind of ongoing, the ongoing traumas that we keep perpetrating. Exactly. Right? And yeah. the word, um, when... It all, everybody who goes to somewhere where they're sort of where they where the resources look abundant to them yeah. consider themselves to be lucky. When the English, when the British first invaded the Americas, they had abundant resources. The British thought, oh, "Hooray, we're a great place!" Because the, the uh, First Nations people there weren't using things like coal. Yes. Same thing here. They came here going, "Oh, look, these people aren't using coal or steel or anything." Therefore, it's all here for us, we just take it. Yes. There's a really um, great sense of that, even in um, um, sort of the opening pages of this. And I refer to that because um, each week the toolkits participants um, have, you know, sort of a couple of readings mm -hmm. to, to get through, I guess. And I, um, I asked everybody to read sort of a, I think it's probably the first five or six chapters yeah. in preparation for this evening. Um, and Part of that is the, of course, the um, find it. the part. I think I bookmarked it so I could find it later. Did I? No. This is good. This is what they call dead air. Um, so I just think it's soft now. Could have been faster. <laughs> um, part of it is the, is the part where. Yeah, sorry, it's very early on. Where's Sister background? Um, is, is kind of talking about how terrible the, the food is um, and how terrible, you know, she, they receive food from home. Yes. Um, and even that is sort of destroyed by the time that it takes to reach them. But there's this um, almost oppressive negativity about about the food. So it goes on for quite, quite some time to the point where it's almost like in a very dark way. It's almost funny because it, it echoes, like food seems like something that's relevant relatively trivial until I suppose you like Jackie and you don't have any. Yeah. But it's also reflective of her attitudes and the, the settler attitudes toward a wider people. Um, and it's also um, indicative of history as well because um, when the colony first was built in 1788, they um, had peopled the place entirely with uh, soldiers and criminals, mm. but no farmers. So they're still getting, they're living on hardtack and salt beef from London. Yes. And of course you can't even that. <laughs> yes. We can, you can survive on it, but you certainly you like probably rather you scared dead. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, I don't want to give too much away, although you've told me you're good at talking around yes. the, <laughs> the big twist. Um, I there's a pretty big sort of um, I didn't know how to describe this. It's kind of a temporal shift, yep. you could say, halfway or not almost halfway through the novel. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm intrigued by how difficult it was. I was blindsided by that, as I'm sure a lot of people were. I was sort of reading reviews and I sensed yeah. I wasn't alone. <laughs> First I felt really dumb and then I was like, I oh, know, it's okay, it should be like that. Um, how did you sort of pull that off from a, 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 I guess, a technical perspective? Well, uh, actually, the, um, as from technical perspective, most of it um, involved having that in mind first. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything from setting character, plot, was all, um, it's, kind of, it's almost kind of right in the middle, right the shift 
the, the change in a story first or the, the important bit first yeah. and write everything else later to make it fit. Like the foundation of a house or Yes, story. but, yeah, but you, you, yeah, you, the, the important bits of the foundation of your story. So you've got, you've got to really worry about that and everything else has to work to make that work yeah. or the whole story is going to work. Did that kind of present any, um, I don't know, I'm, just, I'm interested in like what sort of editorial conversations took place? <laughs> about was, was, was anybody like this doesn't work or no no one no one was um, about it not working but there was one of editorial conversations about how I could tweak things okay no that's to make it well, no no just specifically to make it a little bit more effective okay yes like just to, just to shift the word here shift the word there just make it a little bit more um, actually make the whole novel more effective but um, the the difficulty is. Um, I use a lot of characters' impressions or settings as, mm. as an analogue for their, their personality and identity, yes. and then therefore that was difficult to tweak at times. Yes. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more about that, sort of the intersection between, um, between I mean, we, when we're, we're talking about writing, we often talk about sort of things like, character and dialogue and setting mm -hmm. as though they're discrete and then of course they're not <laughs> can you talk a little bit about um in with sort of reference to this book the intersections between some of those well i have uh, characters are basically my multiple narratives of characters moving through the same environment mm -hmm. all through the book but the environment sometimes the same environment is described quite differently and that's what i did with i use the character's point of view to not only you can I, one of the tweaks i did with my editors they wanted me to change it so that I wouldn't have to say the point of view it was. Yeah. I, um, and the way I did that was um, tweak the descriptions of landscape so you could tell by how they felt about the landscape, who they were. So landscape became, a, um, a, I suppose, an analogue for their identity, mm -hmm. how they reacted to it. So the setting was a, um, it wasn't itself important, but it was also important as a driver of, of characters' behaviours and as a way to, uh, to identify who they were. Yeah, yeah. It, and that's a, I think that's achieved incredibly. Like, it's, it's almost like this filter. It reminds me of, like, I, mm -hmm. do you wear glasses at all, ever? I, I just realised it's a bad metaphor. I, 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 I should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to need reading glasses. <laughs> It's like when you go to the, the optometrist and they, they put the different lenses on your eyes and it completely changes. I've done, I've done like, right. so, so you, <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't know. Some people, some of my mates have perfect 20 vision and I, they've gone through their whole life I without had, ever having that. I had good 20 vision. Well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> I'm as blind as a bat. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's an age where people's eyes start getting worse. Yeah. yeah, for me it was 13. <laughs> I'm glad you lost this book. Um, yeah, so sorry, I just to go back to that sort of that uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of these again, I mean you can you can tell me to stop if I'm getting mm -hmm. too close to giving things away here. Yeah. But one of the things I loved about this novel is that it sort of layers two moments of colonial trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and one is sort of I guess we could say historic, and then the other one is kind of ongoing. This sort of undulation, mm -hmm. it's constant. Um, and when the narrative shifts, that, that sort of big reveal that I was talking about before, it disrupts not only that timeline, but also this sort of the, the binary, as we've come to think of it, until that point in the novel of the na native and the settler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, am, I, am I off track here? Would you? Would you? No, uh, the um, the whole idea of the novel. Was to disrupt yeah. the national well, <laughs> that, that, that was the entire point. Uh, I was the whole point of the novel was to try and think of a way to. Um, someone that once asked me for the quicker, the shortest description I could think of for what Terminator is about, and I said, "This is how it feels." Yeah, and that's it. And we'll, 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 and the whole idea was of the novel was this is how it feels to be. Uh, First Nation person in Australia, yeah. yeah, and to lose your country, lose your family, lose everything. Mm. Um, and so, in order to do that, it's about um, disrupting the um, the cultural binaries in which, uh, on which Australia is built. Yes. 
And you know, like there would be a terrible twist to say how I did that, so I'm not going to. Oh no, that's that's what, that's what I'm coming for. No. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Again, this is not related to setting. I'm just interested. What has been, um, in some ways, that seems like quite a generous thing to do, an incredibly necessary thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a you know a huge a huge task, and I understand the idea of writing the work that you want to see that yes. is not yet present. But it's also a bit, I would imagine a, a really taxing um, and potentially re-traumatizing sort of undertaking. Well, somebody once asked me um, how I, um, they said, oh my God, what a horrible book. Like, not horrible in this whole reading, they enjoyed reading, but what a traumatic book. Um, how can, like, it's really painful to read. And my response is, it came from in me. Yeah, it's painful to live. It's, so it's, painful, <laughs> to live. it's painful for me to live. If you pay for me to read it, imagine how painful it is just to think of it. Mm. Uh, it wasn't really traumatizing because I wrote it at a time that I was kind of tackling the intergenerational trauma and the cultural trauma mm. anyway. So uh, you can't really traumatize when the trauma hasn't gone away. Because yes. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <So, laughs> yeah, I was yeah, already engaged with it. Yeah. No, I think I think it achieves that really effectively. I was just kind of wondering, yeah, how um, you were at Sydney Writers Festival the other week. Yes, it was. Yeah, did you happen to catch the um, the oh my gosh, what's it called? Sweatshop panel in Western Sydney. No, there was an absolute. I was, I was on a panel at the same time in Western Sydney. The other theatre. There was an absolute <laughs> corker of a question from like a middle aged white woman in the audience. Um, and it was effectively, you know, how can you say these things about us? And I guess that's what I meant more by re-traumatising, because I, I can totally understand that it's not so much re-traumatising if you're still experiencing that stuff. Uh -huh. But what is it like to, like, do you think um, when you were writing this book and when you realised it would be published? Yes. I think, like, for instance, when I write, I often don't think, a lot about the reader until we're in the editing stage. It was obviously a different thing for you because you, you said you wrote it sort of expressly with... Yeah, with, I, I wrote it for the reader. Yes. yes, so that's different. But did you, I'm sure you've had similar experiences at festivals and things like that. Did you? Could you have anticipated how, um, I don't know, those sorts of questions and interactions? I not only had that sort of conversation at festivals, but in fact, somebody went tweeting about the what happened at Swedish shop, tweeted that and reminded them of what happened to me in Perth. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, we had a similar experience in Perth um, only what, a month ago, I think Perth Art Festival. Yeah. And, um, or maybe actually probably longer than that because they had time to write essay on it. I've written it's a piece. It's good to like metabolise. No, I've got, I've got commissioned to write a piece. Oh, you know what? Something good should come out. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got commissioned to write a piece on um, basically the use of, um, the targeted use of question time to try mm -hmm. and um, quiet and Aboriginal people. Yes. Which is quite common. And it happens after people come on board. I think it happens us worse. Mm. <laughs> Do you, I don't know, is that, I I don't want to generalise at all, but in conversations with other, you know, friends I've had who are writers mm -hmm. of colour, that's for them, you know, talking about the work in front of people isn't inherently problematic, it's the question, it's the audience. It's, it's the audience questions, it's always the audience questions that are problematic, because mm. um, the audience, audiences who are, um, upset by what you say, well, well, what one says, um, want to reassert their control over the narrative of their identity. Um, and writers of colour, I suppose it is our job to disrupt the mainstream idea of, its, of what it is and what this country is. And then if we achieve that, we upset people because they don't want us to achieve it. Mm. I suppose right, I think it's important. Yes. But also, it's it's hard because you, like the language you just used. Then you said it is our job to disrupt. Mm -hmm. um, I like I, I think a lot about what if what if you're a writer of color or uh, you know another minority, for instance, an LGBTQI writer who's writing. If you're a trans person who is writing, but whose writing does not explicitly engage with you know transness as a political act or what you know whatever it is, yeah. um, there's a certain 
perhaps expectation that we have of writers from you know particular backgrounds to engage with those topics and when they don't like that's that's another form of disruption i think i think um like yes people are expected to be spokespeople for you know and we, we kind of flatten identity and things like that of, of course that, that happens and I, I think if if somebody doesn't want to um be political in their writing they shouldn't be forced to um, but just by existing and writing people who are from minority backgrounds or people from diversity, yes. who fill the diversity quota, <laughs> <laughs> naturally disrupt the yes. status quo because as a country, our discourse is white. Yes. White male cis yes. is the discourse in Australia. And to do otherwise is disrupted anyway. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we can change, can we change tonight the language, language around like disrupting? So that it's more. We can try. Can we do it? <laughs> um, sorry, it's time. Just want to. Okay, we're doing well. Um, yeah, I thought we might just have a kind of general. I feel like I keep getting distracted. Sorry, but a general chat about sort of setting and yep. things like that. How do you, um, aside from from Terranalius, what kind of things um, inform where and when you set a story? Well, a story, I think um, the setting of a story, I think the story has to come first. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever setting works for the story is the setting that you must use. Not must, but you should. And if a setting doesn't exist for your story, make fun. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm sorry, I just have to be angry. I'm very boring and I, a lot of what I write is grounded in, or all of what I write, sorry, is grounded in. Uh, existing places, not necessarily places I've been, but they're, you know, I can I can research research them to the nth degree or possibly visit them. Can you talk a little bit about how sort of research might inform a place that doesn't exist? Well the, the thing is, and this is this is the this is my big secret not big secret, but this is my big thing and a lot of people in speculative fiction and fantasy and horror all say this. Every setting is grounded in the real world. Mm. No matter how fantastical or wacky the setting is, it's always grounded in reality or it won't work. Yes. The list, the, I had this conversation at Sydney Rice Festival um, with the panel was a whole bunch of spectrum writers, mm. um, mostly YA, but I was, I was you know, not <laughs> explicitly YA person there. But um, the, the point of the discussion was this idea that if that the less you change of the real world, the less thing you change, mm. the easier it is for people to believe. So if you change the laws of physics to create a fantastical setting, you have to explain more and more laws of physics and then people will just won't be able to make sense of it. Yeah. If all you change is one thing, like magic is real, or yes. uh, the sun, the day is 48 hours long, or anything, any one thing, you change one thing and it changes the entire world and it's easier for people to get their heads around. Yes. So all settings are based in the real world. It doesn't matter what they are. It's true of like, mm -hmm. um, have you seen, I'm oh, sorry, I'm having a real blank with names tonight. What's that show? Um, British, uh, come on, come on. Um, <laughs> Black Mirror, sorry. I have no, no memory right now. No, I've never, I've never actually seen it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why that show works because um, I've not seen very much of it, but the episodes that I sort of have seen are very much grounded in reality. And yes. then there'll just be a few, like there'll be some, each sort of episode, it's episodic in the sense that um, each episode, it, they're all just sort of standalone, completely distinct, and everyone will focus on a sort of aspect, usually of technology or of society that has been um, uh, twisted in some way and, you know, how, how horrible the effects of that are. It's yeah. not... Not a particularly heartwarming show, is what I would say. I can sort of only take one episode. I'd, I'd probably love it. <laughs> See, I like I like depressing stuff, but this is just some. It's a bit too close to home sometimes. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's as you were talking, I was thinking that's one of the reasons why I enjoy that show in small doses is because it is believable. Well, when, when you have a when people have tried to write um, fantasy science fiction and had to create too much of the world. Mm. They always either get bogged down in world building until it doesn't make sense, or the story is just not believable. Mm. Like the classic one is, no one's ever successfully written a story where not a single character breathes oxygen. Mm. They don't know of. I can't think of one. 
They probably have, but I can't think of one. Or you don't get very many stories where um, um, there's no, where you don't get very many stories where none of the characters can breathe a common atmosphere. Mm. You do get a few, but then you've always got something like one volt around the gas tank. Yes. Um, the, you don't have stories where gravity doesn't exist because mm -hmm. it just wouldn't make sense. So you always have to have a basis in reality or you can't have a story. And when you're kind of, you mentioned world building before, I kind of tend to think that's something that we all need to do as writers, it's whether true. we're working in spec or you know, any other genre. Still, yeah, still, need. still need world building. But um, how do you sort of, what's your process for um, for kind of going about that? Are you more like a bit, in, I, I, like some of us work in a sort of more impressionistic way and then the, there are other people, I'm not among them, but who are like very systematic in how they research? This is, this is the ongoing one. So this, every spec fic writer talks about this. I'm, ex I'm completely impressionistic. Mm. I never, I will generally um, have one idea that's the, that's the core of the world building and everything else kind of, comes as it happens and yes. I need it. And also I, I I believe that I believe personally that what you do is you have your story, you start building a world around the story. And if you get to a point that the um, the world doesn't feel work for the story anymore, change the world yes. and then go back and edit it <laughs> until it fits the rest of the story. Because that's you have to do that, you have to do that. Because you can't break story or abandon your story just because your world doesn't work. Change the world. <laughs> So much work, Claire. Uh, writing is work. Yeah, that's true. Oh boy, that's true. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> um, what about yeah? What about when you're like, what kind of detail is important to you as a writer when you're um, when you're, I guess, building a world or when you're creating? I don't find. I personally don't find um, detail important. But what I do find important um, is. Um, internal logic, internal consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't have a, a world that doesn't make sense of itself. And if mm -hmm. you have internal consistency, um, internal logic in your world building, uh, if you don't have a detail there, you can ignore it. Yes. But you can kind of you can come up with a detail that makes sense with your internal logic as well as your logic. For example, I don't give a shit how hyperspace works. Can you, sorry, for the idiots, in, in, can you explain in, hyperspace? In space type final, there's always fast and light travel. Okay. Right? They've always got some excuse for fast and light travel. Some of them have a big complicated theory of how it works. Mm -hmm. So people can go to other planets you've got. And it's very rarely um, got any sort of, it's got internal consistency, but it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. The classic one is there's detail in Star Trek of the dilithium crystals they need. Mm -hmm. That they always have to, oh no, we have dilithium crystals, we have to land on a planet, get some. And then, but they also have replicators that can make anything. Mm -hmm. Why don't they make those crystals of replicators? Yeah. So this is the internal inconsistency can cause things to fall down, but yes. you can also ignore them. So <laughs> I'm not a big details head. I don't care how spaceships work. I don't care how guns work. They work or they don't. Well, and in some ways, I think it's easier to um, to it's easier to kind of maintain plausibility if you don't have that detail in there. I think it's kind of the same thing as you know when you when you tell a lie. Not that that, but when you tell a lie, it's like the less detail you give, the more believable it is. Everyone, Whereas, everyone lies, most of you just lie to ourselves. <laughs> Everybody lies. Um, Everybody lies. But it is that thing, of sometimes the more detail you give, the more bullshitting it starts to say. Yeah, it's true. And the more, yeah, that's the point of stories. If you don't have, if you don't have the detail there, you don't have to explain the detail. Mm. So I just leave it out. I guess what I was, when I said detail, I wasn't talking about like nitty gritty so mm -hmm. much as, um, I think I was thinking what you said about what you said earlier about um, the sort of uh, the relationship between characters, um, perspective, and setting, and how like the interaction. So I was thinking about how like um, even the way the characters in this book deal with heat, for yes. instance. Yes. So um, you've got Jackie who kind of uses it to his advantage, and the yes. fact that there's a drought is a great advantage. Great for him because it's the yeah the troopers need water, yeah. and he knows where to find water and drought to run for. Yes. Well. It's like in, in rabbit follow rabbit proof fence, mm -hmm. um, they use the rain to their advantage. Yeah. Um, and that they know they're going to be harder to track through wet ground, unless they need like footprints. Um, so, in fact, in the movie rabbit proof fence, you see the older girl look at the sky and see if it's going to rain, and that's she's going to run for it. Um, so, there's a case of if you know the environment, you can use your advantage. And certainly with the details, I think it's important 
um, even in even in third person novels, you've got to look at things from the character's points of view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the last time too, it gets very spooky. Um, you gotta um, look at it from your character's point of view. So yeah. you gotta and the point of view has to be understandable and you have to be detailed in how they react to things. And I think it's more important in a way to know the character than to know the setting to yeah. do that. Yeah. You gotta know how they see it, because you've got to be able to see the character's eyes again. It's a bit someone told me that being a writer is like having multiple personality disorder. You have to be all your characters at once. <laughs> that makes sense to me. There's something in like this sort of method acting. There is. And I've got like, what, seven intertwined narratives? Yeah. That's keep that in your head at once. But they're very distinct. Yeah. Like, it's, I believe that, I, I believe in each of them sort of wholeheartedly. Yes, right? and that, that, was, that was the editing process. Yeah. Um, but there's no sort of slippage between yeah. them. Yeah, yeah that, that's editing. When so actually had the, the statement from the editor about the point of view, they wrote on top of one of my sections. One of my like, little scenes. I don't know whose point of view this is. So I'm not. Oh, that's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but that's okay because um, when I wrote it, I didn't really have a complete. When I wrote the first draft, I didn't really have a conscious understanding of the different points of view and how to do it. So that was in the editing process. So that was, and again, anything wrong with setting, like anything wrong with anything else in the book, fix it in the edit. In your first edit, before you skip it. I was going to say, before, before you... Before you send it off to the publisher, yes. they might go, what are you on? Yes. Uh, you got, you're doing stuff. You always have to edit yourself before anyone else sees it. That's something I have, um, I've kind of, I think I always knew intrinsically, but I've, I've just started saying to people recently, is that I think the first time, you, the first draft, really, the first time you make it to the end of the book or the manuscript or the short story is about telling yourself the story. Yes. And then... The, the, you know, the redraft, the second, the third, the fourth draft, however many it takes before you are finally ready to, ready to show it to somebody. That's where a lot of that kind of finessing comes in. It is. And, that, and that's, yeah, that's when you've got to check that it actually would work for someone else. And also, mm -hmm. a lot of authors say, um, it's like when people talk about carving a marble statue, yeah. chipping away all the bits from the statue, that statue. Well, in writing it the same, except the first draft is building a block of marble. Yes. And then you chip away the bits that don't work. Yeah, that's a much better way of looking at it because people always refer to that sort of. I, I've done it myself, but that sculpture analogy, and yes. really, it's it's, it's really, before that. You give me stuff for it because you've got to put your own chunk yeah. of marble to, to chip away at. So, yeah, story um, editing is is extremely important, and certainly um, when I did my first rewrite, I found um, fault with the setting that um, I had noticed first when I first wrote it and went through and tied it all up, which yeah. took a lot of work. But there are, I, I have friends who are authors who all pretty much agree, not all, not everyone does, but a bunch of my friends agree that the, um, the first rewrite is where the craft of an author comes in, mm -hmm. not the first draft. The first draft, uh, it doesn't matter what you write really, as long as you write something, but the first edit, you're doing your own, that's when you find out what you can write or not. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with that, and I think that I think I think I'm coming to it backwards. I think I've always tried to write, you know, really neatly the first with the first draft, and now I'm working on my second novel, and I'm just letting myself kind of let it be what it is, let it be sort of ugly and messy and half formed. Like I, I, I just started doing this thing where I get halfway through a scene, I don't know where it's going, I just go, okay, I'll come back to it. Yeah, like, well, I'll work I, I do this weird thing where if I get um, writer's block, which there's no such thing as writer's block in the body, when I get stuck temporarily, I'll go back and start a novel and start, um, start a rewrite. Yeah, somebody else does that too. With, on, on the computer, because you, you're not doing it, you just cut and paste, but you go through and you, go, you get stuck and you go back, because then you're reassessing everything you've written before yes. and it fills you into what you've done and by the time you get back to where you were you know what to do next yes so there's an american writer i think i've heard somebody else say this i feel like i maybe read it in i don't know or i might have read it in a podcast there's somebody else who recommends that same thing because yeah. it's sort of like a way of um you're, you're kind of reading yourself back into the work yes. and i write and i write pretty much every day but if i take a week off from the work i always have to start again yeah. and ready for the start but by the time i get the and I've found all the mistakes and I've made the setting consistent. Yes. Because, it, because the story and the characters, nothing's consistent to be over and over and over again. Yeah. So I suppose you could say that I'm in a constant state of rewrite. I, I would, uh, I'm, I'll join you there. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, do you, uh, how do you sort of 
So I'm writing a, a, a book that takes place over sort of quite a long uh, temporal setting at the moment and in many, many different places. It's about, uh, the first part is about um, a young woman growing up in resi homes in sort of mostly out of suburban Melbourne. I'm fortunate enough that I was writing about a section set in Dandenong and that's where my mum grew up. So I asked her if she would come out in the car with me and sort of trundle her around the streets and, you know, she could tell me where the old tech school was and so on and so forth. What I was kind of amazed at when we were doing that was the stuff that I didn't realise was important that became important. So she, we would be driving around and I thought I wanted to know, you know, if, if the miners was there, for instance, or, or what, where the dinnies was. But actually it turned out that, you know, she would sort of start telling me things. Yes. Like, oh, well, this, this bit smelled like cow shit because it was actually really rural back in the 70s. And this particular corner, because of the way, you know, the wind works and things like this, you get the, the trucks coming past and it would smell like, wow. like animal shit. And I was like, yeah, I didn't realise I needed to know that. How much of it do you think is kind of intuition when it comes down to things like, you know, setting Well, that's why um, it's just to a degree, um, depending most of the time, you can get away with almost anything because generally speaking in, in historical fiction, mm. not many people are likely to remember it. So you can get away with yeah. things. But on the other hand, adding extra details to the story, to the um, setting, can can add a bit more power to the narrative. And if they're real details, you don't have to make them up. It's even better. Yeah. For example, Terra Nullius is a fire of cow shit. Yes. Cow, a yes. I wasn't even thinking of that when I mentioned the cow shit. But no, I had a cow shit campfire to Anonymous. When I wrote that bit, um, we were trying to boil the kettle, we were trying to boil the billy, and there was no wood left. And we actually boil the billy on a fire of cow shit. Yes. <laughs> Which is a, a, a thing that's done around the world. Yeah. Uh, in um, parts of the world where people don't have much wood, they burn cow shit, quite yeah. literally. So that's a little thing that it, it puts people, little details put them more, more in the setting than big details do. Mm. And the little details are easy if you don't have to make them up. Yes. Just get the real world. Yes. No, I think, I think you're not alone. So knowing which, called, knowing which area smells like cow shit doesn't help, but knowing the areas can smell like cow shit does. does exactly, exactly. <laughs> and let that be a lesson to us all. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard it here first. Um, what about who are your sort of... Um, if I if I was to say, you know, who do you think are some like contemporary um, fiction authors, mm -hmm. preferably Australian, but whoever you like, who who do really great things with setting? Is there anybody that you sort of return to when you want to you want to remember how how it's done? Uh, well, Kim Scott does yeah. its um, the setting of my sexual country amazingly. Um, he's got very vivid visual descriptions of the landscape. Yeah, the environment they're spectacular, and. Um, my friend Emma Viskic, mm -hmm. um, she, she's interesting in the point of view setting because her main protagonist is death. Yes. So she, so the point of view is is extremely unusual, and that that's kind of good if you want to try and work out how to see the world differently. There's just two examples I think on top of my head. Mm -hmm. So you know, oh, and Alexis Wright. Yeah. She does the setting of the up in Queensland extraordinarily well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, there's actually, I mean, most good writers do settings really well, actually. Yeah. If it, it, it's, I suppose without, without character, the story doesn't work, but without setting, the character's going to let it be. Mm. You can't write characters in a void. Do you, are you one of those people that um, um, sort of thinks of character, sorry, thinks of setting a bit like character? I do, think like of setting, character? I do think of setting like a character. Yeah. Um, I don't think of setting so much as just a, a stage um, because um, setting has more to it than that. A stage is static, setting moves. Um, setting can be a protagonist, yeah. it can be an antagonist, um, but your setting can get hurt, yeah. your setting can hurt the characters. Um, it's definitely a character, it's particularly in Terra Nullius, I think I played with um, setting as a character quite a lot. Yeah, and it, it's not, it's um, yeah, it's really interesting when you're talking about how it can sort of hurt the living people. Yeah, and just from, you know, there's this real interplay between not just how, like we were talking earlier, about how the characters view the landscape yep. or view their environment, but it's also how the how landscape is. Yeah, and and um, the idea that, that the landscape can choose who gets to live and who gets mm. to die. And it can. And that, that comes down to um, a lot of the beliefs among 
some First Nations Australian people mm -hmm. that um, your country looks after you, yes. and if you're not in your country, it won't look after you. Yes. And that's kind of that. That's an important thing about, this. and that's something in a setting in Australia people are not aware of. It. There's people who live here who believe wholeheartedly that the landscape itself decides who's welcome and who isn't. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. mm. There's a really beautiful. It just made sorry. It just made me think. Then there's a really beautiful passage in um, Malmimbi by Melissa Lichtenko. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, that she's talking about. Um, the main character, Jo, is, um, is sort of standing on her land and I think she's, I, I, if I remember this correctly, she's ridden a horse at this particular point in this, you know, very lush, um, coastal, beautiful environment. And she realises that um, it's a, there's a beautiful line about either she could run, you know, as far as she possibly could without being winded in any single direction, she'd still be on her own land yes. and kind of how, how significant that was for her. And there's a, there's a scene in um, that Dead Man Dance by Kim yes, Scott yes. where a um, character, what's his name? I don't know. It's uh, my Bobby, Kim Scott. <laughs> uh, Bobby is walking cross country and suddenly he reaches the borders of his own land. Yes. And the ground is softer. He knows where the creeks are going to run. He knows how to dodge the trees. So suddenly, as soon as he crosses over this border, everything becomes, it becomes like heaven itself rather yes. than being. A dump. <laughs> yeah, well, home, the idea, the whole idea of home takes on a completely different significance. It's like the earth itself is, yes. is welcoming him rather, yes. than, rather right. than it just being familiar. And I, I, I was certainly um, aware of that, that scene when writing with the Jackie mm -hmm. scenes and how Jackie was one the country. I didn't steal from this. <laughs> <laughs> um, was that, what was that like writing that scene? Did it, was that something that required a lot of, um, Revision, or did it just writing writing Jackie's stuff? Yeah, or that particular scene, I guess. Or it's not that scene, but his um, his way of thinking. Yeah, um, it took a lot of editing. Everything takes a lot of editing, but um, Jackie's experience of country, uh, it's like um, combining how I see going to certain places with how I've read other people describing yes. being on country. And it, it, part of it also is my feelings of the first time I went to the beach in my ancestral country, yes. which is only um, because I didn't grow up in countries. So I was very, grew up in Melbourne? No, I grew up in Perth. Okay. But it's a very strange experience to return to country is, and go to the beach. Mm. Mm. No, it's, um, yeah, it's a very, it's a very moving book and I think I mean, I, I know it will do great things. It's already doing great things. But I, I for me, it certainly set up everything that you, you wanted it to achieve. Oh, good. So thank, you good. For, thank you for writing it. Nice. Um, thank you for, for sharing it with us. Are we, sorry, I'm just conscious of, um, of nearing our time being up. Did we, do we have any questions that I have missed? Just so checking with our camera um, star here. Um, we don't have any questions that I've missed, so I feel like I did a good Tony Jonesing. Um, I didn't even know she'd do it. I didn't have to do anything, <laughs> so, which is the best kind of Tony Jonesing. Um, yes, yeah, so that brings us to, to an end. Uh, that wraps up our final live broadcast for the Toolkits Fiction. Um, this session, like all of them, will be available on Facebook and on the Express Media website um, if you would like to revisit any of tonight's scintillating discussion about cow shit and beyond. <laughs> Um, Lots of talk about cash. Yeah, I mean, and, and who amongst us does not, does not love a bit of that? Um, tomorrow night you can tune into the Toolkits non-fiction broadcast, um, which is same place, same time, um, same hashtag. Uh, and on that one, Royce Kamala will be chatting about literary journalism. So mm -hmm. if you're into narrative non-fiction or you're thinking of entering the Scrap non-fiction prize, that's one maybe for you. Um, and I think that just about wraps it up. Thank you so much for joining us. No, thank today. you. Thank you for having me. No, um, please go out and if you haven't read it already, please find a copy of Taryn Elias either at the bookstore or at the library um, and give it to give it to other people once you've read it. Give it to 
give it to the person who you think might be that white woman. But don't, but if you do read it, don't give away the yeah, spoilers. Yeah, don't give away the spoilers. So you just, you'll, it'll just ruin it for everybody. Yes, else. it's really hard to talk about it without doing that. So I, there's, there's so much stuff I would have loved to cover tonight that we, we couldn't. But, um, yeah, give it, give it to, share it around, give it to as many people as you can, and um, we look forward to seeing what you do next. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>